By early 1997, Southeast Asia's rapid economic boom was overheating. Siravat Vorovet was one of many who thought the good times would never end. Ever since I was a child, I have been wanting to be a multimillionaire. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to do something that no one has done. Build a luxurious condominium. I knew a lot of rich people. And multi-millionaires would like to take time off to play golf, to enjoy the fresh air in mountains, which you cannot find in Bangkok. I looked at the golf course. It was designed by Jack Nicklaus. I put my effort to make it one of the most beautiful condominiums in, in Thailand. Still today, the mountains in the background with a fairway and a lake in front of the condominium. It's really beautiful. People were just buying apartments and condominiums just like they, they were gambling. They were tempted by this easy money. They were tempted by this easy profit. During the 90s, Thailand had opened up its capital markets. For the first time, local businesses could borrow money from foreign banks, which offered lower interest rates. People would come and knock on your door and plead with you to borrow money. Uh, be they you know, European banks or Japanese banks. They came and begged us to, to, to borrow from them. In just four years, loans to Thai businesses had tripled to over $200 billion. American and European governments encouraged the inflow of money. Oh yeah, we were strong advocates of opening up capital markets and the benefits that could flow therefrom. But we were also strong advocates at the same time, because we recognized the tie, of developing the banking systems, developing the capital markets, and developing regulatory systems, none of which is easy. And there was an underlying flaw in the system that people really didn't focus very much on, which was the institutional weakness. What that meant is that the banking systems were not well developed, the securities laws were not well developed, they were not, they had not kept up with the development of these economies and their integration into the, war, into the, into the world economy. Thailand's central bank had kept its currency artificially high, fueling the speculative bubble. The International Monetary Fund, which acts as a bank of last resort to countries in financial trouble, began to worry that Thailand was heading for a fall. I went to uh, Bangkok in May 1997. It was full of cranes everywhere and uh, it looked like the boom would never end. But there were very weak banks who were lending against the security of those buildings which were never going to be filled. Mong Tong Thani was a sign of the times, a new city built from scratch for 700,000 people. It was meant to be bigger than Boston, but almost no one was moving in. The vision was great. The vision was to take uh, this huge tract of land and build a city, basically, uh, between the downtown congested Bangkok and the airport. Uh, so the concept was, was excellent. The problem was that it was financed to a great degree by U.S. dollars. Thailand's currency, known as the baht, was pegged to the dollar. As the Thai economy weakened, Financial markets sensed this policy couldn't last. 
Thailand had fixed its, uh, the value of its currency in terms of dollars. It had a fixed exchange rate. And uh, as people begin to wonder, well, do they actually have enough dollars to always be able to give me dollars in exchange for the baht, the Thai currency I have? And uh, when they begin to wonder about that, they start asking for the dollars. The central bank kept on saying, no, no, we will support the currency at this fixed rate. And of course, they were shelling out the U.S. dollars uh, to protect the currency. So their foreign reserves were dwindling. And of course, any hedge fund manager looking at that would say, hey, these guys are going to be in trouble, and I'm going to short the Thai baht. The baht came under relentless market pressure. In July 1997, the Thai government was forced to devalue. The bubble had burst. The Asian financial crisis was about to begin. Okay, here we are. When it hit, I realized my uh, fate. I could not sell a single unit when the crisis hit. And this was my most expensive model unit. Now no more doors, our decorations, materials gone. My condominium is called uh, American Dream Kitchen. Home Dream Condominium. But we are broke. Even my clients who were multi-billionaire broke also. The economic shock reverberated through all levels of Thai society. When the economy went bad, my husband's salary was cut 30%. I was lucky. I kept my job, but I didn't get a rest. To support our family, my husband had to find other work. Every morning, he drives a motorcycle taxi. The cost of living was rising. Everything was going up. Water, electricity, even so. But the salaries were staying the same or even going down. With its economy in a virtual free fall, Thailand received an emergency rescue loan from the International Monetary Fund. When that didn't work, the Thai government asked Washington for even more help. No one imagined that an economy as small as Thailand's could spark a global crisis. Thailand is a very small economy. It doesn't have a lot of links, and it's not exactly in your backyard. In any event, the U.S. Uh, chose not to intervene in Thailand, thinking it was not going to spill over. Why would it? Uh, why, the contagion effects were not apparent to anybody, not just the administration. I think they misjudge the situation. They misjudge the situation. And uh, probably because it was seen too much as a financial issue rather than an overall strategic issue. Global markets worried that other Asian countries might have similar hidden flaws. Like a classic run on the bank, money began to pull out of the entire region. They called it contagion. And at each stage, the crisis uh, turned out to have a virulence which became known as contagion, much greater than it had been anticipated. And what that really reflected was indeed globalization, was the way these economies had become locked together. And investors looked at emerging markets. They said, there's a problem in Thailand. Well, then there's a problem in these other countries. And so each, each, each step of the crisis created these shock waves that carried on into the next. Contagion spread to Thailand's neighbors. Malaysia's economy had seemed stable. Suddenly, it too was facing relentless pressure from global markets. We have the uh, currency going down and down and down, and we have the stock market doing the same. And we felt totally helpless. Uh, we feel that. Uh, there is no way we can, uh, we can recover. 
So, I mean, the feeling is really very bad, very frightening. Contagion next hit Indonesia, the most populous country in the region. Its government collapsed. Its cities descended into chaos. The fund managers did know the difference between Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore. They just said, I want out. Property prices collapse, companies collapse. And in the case of Indonesia, the social fabric collapsed. <laughs> Churches have been burned, mosques have been attacked. They have killed each other. And it's all the fallout of an economic collapse. This was a new kind of financial crisis, unlike anything the International Monetary Fund had ever encountered. The IMF organized huge loans for Indonesia and other Asian nations. On the condition they cut government spending raise interest rates and eliminate corruption. You are the doctor going in to deal with a very sick patient. The public blames the doctor for the fact that the patient is sick, but the patient was sick to begin with. But these things are societally wrenching, and there are huge vested interests. And you wouldn't get into these crises if the vested interests weren't that important. That, I think, is one of the reasons why it takes political change to deal with a crisis as big as this. To some of the region's entrenched leaders, the IMF's conditions smacked of a new kind of colonialism. Presently, we see a well-planned effort to undermine the economies of all the ASEAN countries by destabilizing their currencies. In the old days, you need to conquer a country with military force, and then you can control that country. Today, it is not necessary at all. You can uh, destabilize a country, make it poor, and then make it uh, a request for help. And for the help that is given, you gain control over the policies of a country. And when you gain control over the policies of a country, effectively, you have colonized that country. The market forces were simply too powerful for the IMF or any government to contain. In late 1997, contagion reached Korea, one of the most successful economies in the world. It was uh, unbelievable uh, that the crisis uh, has spread as quickly as uh, uh, to Indonesia and Korea uh, within a matter of six months or seven months. But the uh, world was much more globalized than we thought uh, it was at that time. In the last week of December of 1997, the 11th largest country, economy rather, in the world, which is Korea, had roughly speaking four billion of reserves left and was using reserves at the rate of one billion dollars a day. Well, it didn't take a great deal of quantitative insight to see that that was not a long-term viable situation. Korea had been misleading the world, claiming it had enough money to withstand the crisis. The IMF's Stanley Fisher arrived in Seoul to inspect the central bank's accounts. I visited Korea a couple of days before they uh, turned to the IMF for help. And there was a state of panic. And it was at that point that uh, I went to the central bank and was shown how much money was left in the Korean central bank. It was essentially all gone. Korea was about to default on its loans from Japanese and Western banks. Pressured by their governments, the banks agreed to share some of the pain. They rolled over their loans. Korea was then given the largest bailout in history. If they had done that in Thailand, I think that uh, they would have 
not only avoided some economic problems, but I think that the sense in Southeast Asia that the Americans uh, were really on the side of putting things right would have been stronger. Then a very, very strange thing happened from about the 1st of February, 1998, until August. There was a period in which financial markets essentially decided that risk didn't exist anywhere. Markets thought contagion had been contained in Asia. Investment flowed elsewhere. Some came to Russia, where the Moscow stock market was the best performing in the world. But economic reforms had stalled, and Russia was heavily in debt. Even so, investors were convinced they'd found an emerging market that couldn't fail. Investors had decided Russia is an ex-superpower, it has lots of missiles and lots of atomic warheads for them. Certainly, you could not have a financial accident in Russia because the rest of the world, the rich countries, would bail Russia out. Well, it turned out that that was wrong. Russia defaulted on its debt. Its currency plummeted. Global investors were stumped. All these people who in the previous seven months had decided there was no risk anywhere literally panicked and decided there's got to be massive risk everywhere. Behind each fence and barnyard wall, there must be a risk that we hadn't thought of, kind of like the Redcoats re retreating from Lexington. Everywhere, markets were freezing up. The economic crisis seemed to have taken on a life of its own. I thought at the time that I had a pretty good sense of what was going on, but what I didn't know, and nobody could possibly have known, was not what was going on at the moment that you were looking at, but what was going to happen at the next moment. Well, when you get in a room with both Alan Greenspan and Robert Rubin and they say they're scared to death, and they've never seen anything like this, and they're worried about whether or not we can get through it. I get worried, because they know a heck of a lot more about it than I do. You had the contagion sweeping across all the developing countries. As Rubin said, we've never seen that before. I mean, maybe in the Depression they saw that over a period of time, but nothing that happened that quickly. 